ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Kerrigan. <laughs> welcome, welcome to Witch Talk. So, welcome to Witch Talk. My name is Kerrigan. I'm not really... All right. Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> I want to be chroma keyed, but apparently I can't... Oh, okay. Here we go. So, welcome to Witch Talk. My name is Kerrigan, and today we have a fantastic guest with us today. She is an accomplished woman in many, many areas, including an author of a fantastic book about Wicca that we're going to talk about. But before we go there, I wanted to um, uh, welcome everybody in the chat room, because I know that there's some people from Spain, um, there are um, other people from other places, if you, if, if from Portugal also, so welcome everyone, and also Master Nestor, which is our... Um, um, <laughs> usual, you know, uh, uh, viewer. So um, it w I want to welcome everyone. If you want to to, to uh, ask somebody in the chat um, uh, something in the chat room, you can do it. You know how to do it, and just ask the question, and I will defer to the guest. Now, uh, before we go anywhere, and kind of. Um, uh, uh, you know, into the the interview. I just wanted to to tell you how you can contact us on Witch Talk. After that, I'm going to talk about three fantastic books from uh, a very very special author. So here we go. So you want to know how to keep in touch with everything Witch Talk? Go to www.witchtalkshow.com and follow all the latest news. Listen directly to the show and enjoy it. Don't forget that all episodes of Witch Talk will be available to you on demand on Ustream. Click on Twitter, Facebook or Google Plus on our own Ustream page and spread the word. Don't forget to join us on Ustream Crowd. Go to www.ustream.tv slash channel slash witchtalk dash show. Do you want to be part of the show? Join our incredible conversations live on every show right here on Witch Talk. Witch Talk will air every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or approximately 9 p.m. in most Europe. Now live in video, watch us on Ustream. Follow us on Twitter at Carrigan, K-H-A-R-A-G-A-N with an H after the K. Or send us an email at witchtalkshow at gmail.com. Now back to the show. Yes, back to the show it is, and uh, here we are again with uh, Witch Talk. Now, I want to talk to you about a little bit about uh, three fantastic books from one unique author. Um, his name is uh, David Conway. Everybody knows who David Conway uh, is. He's uh, an occultist and a magician, um, English occultist and magician. Uh, one of the books that I have, from, I have three books from him. One is The Complete Magic Primer, and it's a fantastic book that I really recommend everyone to have. Um, it says, the aim of this book is quite straightforward. It is to show that magic actually works. Precise instructions are given and to the reader, and, and, and then you can try a little bit of magic for yourself. But the rituals mentioned here are not to be taken lightly. Spells do work, which can be unnerving. Magic really does hold the key to many mysteries and the key is now within your grasp. So magical magic primer, the complete magic primer from from, from David Conway. You can get this um, in on eBay. It's out of print. Um, it's uh, printed by Aquarian. This is uh, actually uh, um, a copy that I got, um, but th this copy is from eighty eight, nineteen eighty eight. So it's uh, it's not really something that you will find in a shop right now. So I think that it's a good thing that you. Um, would buy this this fantastic book if you're interested in magic and what magic is about um, and how to do it. 
So that's that. Um, another book from David Conway, The Magic of Herbs. It's a fantastic little book. Again, another book that's out of print, but very, very good. Um, it, and, and it says, David Conway, an acknowledge, acknowledge expert in the field of magic, learn his herbal folklore f- as a child at the hands of an old Welsh wizard. Now, this is the book if you wanted to know about uh, magic and herbs, not just herbs, um, this is a book to buy. David Conway, The Magic of Herbs. And, and, and uh, last, last, the last one, but not least, um, um, uh, it's, it's Magic Without Mirrors, The Making of a Magician, David Conway, by Logius Publishing. This his is how to bi- autobiography. It's a fantastic book about magic and living it. So it's absolutely amazing. It's a very, very nice book um, by the same author, David Conway. And maybe, maybe, we uh, can talk uh, with David one day about this. So uh, that's my intake. So again, uh, the complete magical primer and the magic of herbs and also uh, magic without mirrors. Uh, This book was actually launched in London um, two years ago, one year ago, uh, in the Atlantic Bookshop. So it's very, very good and um, a very nice book. So that's it. Let's just uh, go into the introduction of our guests and uh, we will see a little bit more about uh, what's going on um, with with the interview. So uh, if you have any questions, please do it on the chat room and, um, and we will answer, more, more than glad to answer you the questions. So here we go. Over the years, she has facilitated a variety of Gardner and Wiccan groups. She is co-editor of the international and bilingual magazine We Can Read, which was launched in 1979 and co-founder of Silver Circle, a Wiccan network in the Netherlands. She travels extensively, giving workshops. She represents the PFI at the World Parliament of Religions in July 2004 in Barcelona, Spain. In cooperation with the National Coordinator for PFI Turkey, she leads a PFI delegation in the culture visit to Turkey in September 2005. She also gave workshops in Uppsala, Sweden and Milan, Italy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my guest today on Witch Talk, Morgana Scytho. (laughs) Welcome, Morgana. Good evening, Carrigan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> well, you're coming over loud and clear. I hope I'm uh, loud and clear as well. Oh, you are. You're absolutely All the way from are. the Netherlands. I love saying yes. to people, hello, greetings from the Netherlands. Un <laughs> point. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's absolutely amazing. One of the things that I really... I mean, you're originally from England, right? Yes, that's correct. Yes, that's correct. Yes, yes. And then you moved to the Netherlands. And it's it's absolutely fantastic. Because, you know, when I talk to you, I always... Um, you know, you're English. So it's kind of like when we talk, you're in... And I think that you are in England, but you're not, actually. You're in no, no, that's correct. We're. Um, <laughs> I'm actually in the Netherlands. and yes. um, But I was born in, in Wales. Um, which is still part of the United Kingdom, um, yes. but I'm not actually allowed to call myself English on my yes. passport. But most people uh, are referring to themselves as being British. Um, yes. But I always say, well, I just happen to be in Wales, or my mother happened to be in Wales when I was born. But my family are actually from Lancashire in the north of England. Yes, yes, yeah. very, very nice, very nice. So, welcome to Witch Talk. It's wonderful to have you here, and and we're going to talk Thank about you. your book. And we're going to talk about you because we want to know who Morgana is, um, <laughs> like we don't know, like we don't know. Uh, but you know, the thing is that I think that um, it's it's very important for people to just go and 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 listen to. You know, sometimes people don't really know. I mean, they know who you are. You are, the, mm-hmm. you know, you mm-hmm. have so many things and you've done so many things and you're still doing it. Um, but sometimes it's just you know they know Morgana, but they don't really know you know where Morgana comes from so that that's my question yeah. when, when did you begin to be interested in the occult and in in witchcraft and all of this um 
a bit of an anecdote. I was um, one of those uh, children at school who was not always um, doing what they were supposed to be doing, and I was constantly getting what we called in England detention, mm. and uh, which meant I had to sc stay behind at school after four o'clock, and and that particular point I ended up having to spend uh, about an hour after school in the library which was really really a punishment for me because I thought whoa <laughs> what a fantastic <laughs> place to be for an hour and I just happened to be I was supposed to be sitting there doing nothing and contemplating on how bad I was and I just happened to look up and I saw this book at least the the um uh title of the book and I couldn't quite make it out and I kind of glanced my head to the left or right or whichever way it was and I saw this word Bhagavad Gita I thought hmm what sort of book is that and that was actually my first flirt if you like with mm -hmm. um, anything to do with spirituality beyond what I knew from Christianity and I was absolutely fascinated by this book. I, I read, you know, suddenly the, the exploits and adventures of Krishna. And uh, I was fascinated by the, um, the colourful stories. Strange enough, I wasn't really uh, in a family who, who read books. Uh, we, we did have storytelling, but we weren't really... We have to remember, it was in the um, 60s we're talking about. Um, I came from very, very... Uh, working class background and we just really didn't have any of the children who were actually uh, going to college so it was um, quite nice for me to be able to enter the world of literature and I was actually very interested in, in plays and that was when my uh, interest for plays for, for um, theatre was also awakened mm -hmm. so first of all I, I enjoyed looking at the wonderful world of mythology and actually went on to um, uh, to follow a course for teacher training, and I actually did in the in the end uh, follow a course which in which I did drama and dance. Oh. Um, that again awakened a lot of my uh, interest in in ritual, since of course um, Greek drama is basically the um, the the basis of our ritual practice. Mm -hmm, at least mm -hmm. from, uh, if you look at it from a historical point of view. Mm -hmm. So I was already, when I was in my teenage uh, years, coming to late teens, already interested in the world of, in a way, imagination, uh, magic, fantasy, but it was more from the world of, of theatre. Mm -hmm. I was also very interested in music, and one of the um, bands which I was really, really into at the time was the Incredible String Band. Now, I don't know if anybody can remember, but they actually, the Incredible String Band were in, in, at uh, um, Woodstock. Um, there were a group from, basically from Scotland with Mike Heron, Robin Williamson, who is now actually still very much involved in Celtic uh, spirituality. Mm -hmm. It was also through their music that I became very uh, interested in pagan concepts um, I saw them many, many times in England uh, while I was actually still at training, teach training college. I also went to a lot of theatre um, festivals at the time. But by the time of the, the mid seventies, I'd finished my train, teacher training, and uh, I wasn't really, really into spirituality. As I said, it was really through theatre and music that I was interested in all things magical if you like uh -huh. but there was a, a kind of yearning to be I'm not sure what it was at the time but I remember thinking I'd love to be one of those priestesses in some of the, these wonderful plays these Greek dramas um, so I decided after uh, teacher training that I would you know uh, I had to do my first year of, of teaching but then I thought no really what I'd like to do is go to India so suddenly this uh, <laughs> This idea of going to India at the time, people were still going uh, overland to India. Um, so I, I thought, well, okay, I'll do my first year of uh, teacher uh, teaching, which happened to be in Liverpool. Yes. And then um, after the, the first year, I said, that's it, I'm off now. I've got my uh, certificates. I'm a fully de uh, diplomaed, uh, registered teacher by that time in, um, uh, you know, uh, what we call primary school teaching. Yes. So then I decided that I would actually start uh, traveling. And my first port of call was the Netherlands. 
Oh. Now, at that time in the Netherlands, it was still at the edge of um, all the whole hippie thing. Um, Holland was at that time, especially Amsterdam, was still the centre of uh, psychedelic world of, well, lots and lots of drugs, of course. And, of course, in Amsterdam, um, there was the um, a lot of music around still, which was, for me, a, a wonderful place to be. Mm-hmm. As it happened, um, I was actually working at an anthroposophic institute um, and I ended up teaching um, children, handicapped children actually. Mm-hmm. Although the first year I was just uh, trying to learn the language of course, I, th- I didn't speak Dutch at the time. I had really no idea about anthroposophy and I had no real experience of working with handicapped children. But that's how it basically started. But in between all this, I was still interested. What you know, what was anthroposophy about? It's Rudolf Steiner. So I started learning more and more about um, uh, the Rudolf Steiner anthroposophic uh, view on life, yeah. and started reading a lot of books about occult science. Um, and that's basically how I started really, really on the path of um, learning more about spirituality and uh, and so on. No, so those, no. those are the early roots. Those early are the roots, early. yes, yes, yes. yes. But, then, yes. but then you begin interested. I mean, how did you find Wicca? Well, that's uh, again one of those things. I, I met somebody. Um, in fact, um, he ended up, uh, would then later be my partner. Um, we were t- we were talking actually. Um, he was very interested in, in England, and I still couldn't speak very good Dutch at the time. <clears throat> but he was very interested in. Um, England and and he also had a great love for Lancashire and I said you know why you know what, what what's what's Lancashire got to do with anything you know, of all things <laughs> yes. and um, he said well w- when you're talking he said it, you've got something that's very very close to what I think is is the old religion and I went what say that again <laughs> what, what are you talking about the old religion and suddenly a lot of things for me fell into place and I suddenly thought oh my goodness um I grew up in Lancashire. I knew I knew about uh, Pendle Hill and, of course, the Lancashire witches. And, of course, I, I, during my college years, I, I spent a lot of time in Manchester. Yes. And there, of course, we had it all about the strange goings-on in Alderley Edge, which, of course, yes. was later uh, Alexander and uh, uh, Maxine. Yes. I used to yes. have lots of rituals up in Alderley Edge. So, yes. in fact, I already knew about the old religion but I didn't know about Wicca yes. if you see what I mean yes. so I, I, I then asked uh, Merlin um, you know, tell me more and that is actually how I found out about Wicca and he said yes of course it's a, it's a modern day religion I said you're joking how, <laughs> how is that you know, I'm, I'm, I know all about these witches and stuff like that but you know tell me more so he did he, he he was the one who actually told me he'd already met um maxine and in london she had her famous um you know evenings where people yes. could go and actually find out more about uh, wicca mm-hmm. although i think at the time uh, he, he he said she would talk about witchcraft i don't think maxine at the time was all very much into you know this word wicca it was very much yeah. witchcraft Yes. <laughs> so he t- he told me about uh, Maxine, and of course I was I was fascinated by it. I was because you know this is I'm I'm looking, I want to be a priestess. Um, so tell me more. But by that time, I decided actually this was now three years into being in the Netherlands, and I still wanted to go to India. So. I said, yeah, I, it's all very nice, um, but I, I really, really do feel that I should go to India. By that time, we had a relationship, but, but it was it was very, 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 yeah, new. And we were still quite young, and I really didn't think um, it was going to develop into anything, you know, special serious. or serious. <laughs> and so I said, look, you know, I, I really would like to go to India. You know, you're very welcome to come if you like. <laughs> but of course, he was. <laughs> studying so he said no 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 um so i said well okay yeah uh, i'm going to go back to my parents spend a few weeks at home and in england and then i'll set off to um to greece and then start off the overland trip to the uh, to india i was only home about two weeks and then suddenly um 
there was Merlin sitting on our doorstep. <laughs> he decided to come to England before I left for India, <laughs> and, <laughs> which was very, very sweet. I mean, this is how we were. We were it was, you know, young and in love, and, and we were just very, very curious. Yeah. So we, we went actually up to Pendle Hill, and I, whether our seal, our future or, or fate was sealed, I don't know. It's always hard to, to pinpoint moments when you think that was when it was, you know, the gods yes, yes, had yes. called us. And, but it was certainly just before I left for India, it was, it was almost as if, well, if we're meant to be together, we will be together. And, and we more or less said goodbye on Pendle Hill and said, you know, we'll keep in touch. But I wasn't sure if we would keep in touch or not. Yes. Um, but then I, I, I did go to India. I went first of all to Greece, um, spent quite a long time in Greece, and then made the overland trip to India. And I would, I would say to, to Merlin, you know, I'm going to be in Istanbul uh, next month or Tehran or... Um, Delhi and actually he wrote every month and I would collect letters from him at the Post Restante in, 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 in Delhi and etc. So we did actually keep contact for the whole year I was away uh, but when I came back <clears throat> um, I, I first of all went back to England but I thought no I, I don't belong in England I actually you know should go back to the Netherlands so I went back to the Netherlands and that's when we actually started having a, a serious relationship and that's when we started looking more for witchcraft for Wicca as a serious option and that's when our, re our real search for Wicca started so that would that was about 1978 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. late 70s yeah yes, yes that's when it really now, really started you told me some some you know when, when we talked uh, that you you were almost an Alexandrian oh <laughs> Almost an Alexandrian. That sounds like it. Yeah. I, I, well, more. Well, yes, I was. It was. Um, we. Oh my. Had, um, no, no, no. It's. Um, we'd actually been in England. Uh, Merlin and I had actually been in England earlier on holiday, mm -hmm. and we met some um, Alexandrians actually in Lewis in England. Yeah. But Dennis or Merlin had also had contact with Alexandrians in the Netherlands very, yes. very early on. Um, he'd, he'd had contact with them while I was actually in India. So when I came back, he said, yes, he'd had contact. But for some strange reason, um, his initiation was delayed. Or f f Again, you can say, well, why was it delayed? We yes. went to England. We talked to some, um, again, Alexandrians. I'd just come back from India. I was still kind of all, all very much into the spirituality of, of the Eastern uh, you know, Hindu philosophy, etc., um, but Merlin had actually got uh, an appointment with Alex yes. down in Bexhill. So yes. he and uh, the guy, we, uh, a couple we were staying with, they actually went down to Bexhill to see to see Alex. Uh, I didn't actually go um, because it was Dennis who did, had had all the connections with with Alex and Maxine. So I didn't actually meet Alex. But when he came back, of course, it was, yeah, he, he was really, really um, enthralled with, with yeah. Alex and, of course, he really, really liked uh, Maxine as well. But the strange thing was that um, the guy we were staying with, he did um, a, a tarot reading and it was strange but obvious that Merlin and I were going to perhaps have more to do together but also not. It was it was a rather strange reading, and we weren't <laughs> quite sure what it was all all about. Whether it was meant that I was supposed to become more interested in Alexandrian Wicca, but when we got back to the Netherlands, I did actually go and see the people that uh, he'd also been meeting, and mm. had uh, a couple of really nice conversations. But some strangely enough, we we never got together for a serious talk about initiation. Mm -hmm. um, that came later um, when we actually got back to England and we, we found an address for a Gardnerian couple and that actually did, um, you know, uh, materialise in, in us actually be both being initiated. But it could have been, we could have been initiated into an Alexandrian coven. It was, as I said, it was one of those yeah. things that fate yes. 
had yes. other ideas absolutely. with us or had other absolutely. plans, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes it happens. Now, uh, the other thing that, um, you know, one of your offices is um, coordinated for the international, P PFI International, Peg and Federation mm -hmm. International, and you do quite, you know, uh, travel a lot on these things and, and, and you go to various countries, you, you just, you know, help people and you go. And, and you, we know that the Pagan Federation has um, nucleuses of, of PFI all over the world, including in Portugal, where I come from. Um, yes, so, that's correct. Yes. <laughs> um, and I actually, I, I, I'm not a member of the PFI right now, um, or the PF, um, but um, but I was at the time, and I was, you know, working with them in Lisbon, and, you know, I was seeing the members or the prospect member, you mm -hmm. know, all of those things. And it was very interesting. Now, when did you begin interested in, what, when does the P Pagan Federation uh, come into the scene for you? Mm, all right. Um, mm. Well, uh, picking up the thread, um, we were initiated in 1979. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what's the first thing you do when you get initiated? You start a newsletter. <laughs> Nobody yes. knew anything about Wicca in, in the Netherlands, really. So we started, uh, we actually launched Wiccan Raid in 1980. Yes. Uh, and, and started basically what was our, our networking. Uh, we call it the Center for uh, the Old Religion. Um, and that was actually Silver Circle. So we started in, in 1980, really, with the Silver Circle with Wiccan Raid, yes. and we basically started uh, talking with people and also trying to find out how we wanted to interpret uh, Wiccan philosophy, how we saw um, the, the connection with the gods, etc. So for the first five years, a lot of people have the idea that we, you know, initiated in 1979 and we immediately started with the coven. Actually, it took five years before we, we found somebody who we felt comfortable with, who felt comfortable with us. So it was only actually mm -hmm. 1984 mm -hmm. that we started our own coven. Mm -hmm. But after that, of course, it snowballed and uh, we were doing many, many things. But by 1990, I think it was about 1990, 95. A lot of my friends, of course, in England were also uh, connected with Pagan Federation. And it was only really in the late 80s, early 90s that Pagan Federation became much more structured. Um, there was a constitution, but it was all still very, very, very informal. I think uh, at that time, uh, Prudence Jones was uh, actually uh, taking care of the administration um, and she had uh, the magazine called The Wiccan. So when we came up with Wiccan Raid and The Wiccan, um, we would exchange magazines. And of course, we were, we were going back to England quite a lot. A lot of our, our Wiccan friends, we would talk mm -hmm. about things. And of course, Pagan Federation was the, the, the platform where we would meet other uh, witches, but also other pagans, of course. Yes. So... I think it was about 1995, 96, when um, I was suddenly confronted with somebody who wanted to be uh, PFI Netherlands. And I went, hang on, who is this? <laughs> what are we talking about here? Uh, I, I did have a membership with, with PF, and we did have, uh, of course, by that time it was Pagan Dawn. I think it was Pagan Dawn by then, yes. We did have mm -hmm. an exchange. So I, I knew what was going on with the PF, but suddenly I, I had a, a notification that um, somebody from Belgium was, was um, going to be PFI Belgium and the Netherlands and I, I thought hmm this is rather strange and I got in touch <laughs> with well, I think uh, uh, Anthony Kemp who was then yes, looking after Anthony the overseas members um, yes. actually got in touch with me and um, so we, we started talking I said look you know how many people are there in the Netherlands who've actually you know who are overseas members and he said well I'm not actually sure and I said well I, I think it's really more appropriate that um, that I, I kind of you know get in touch with these people because I know many of the Wiccan friends in, in, in England and uh, also pagan friends in England. Yes. So he thought it was a good idea. And it turned out about 25 people had actually uh, uh, were, were members then in, in the Netherlands. But I said to, to Anthony, I think it would be a good idea if, um, if I also asked one of my Alexandrian friends also to do it together so it would be a good signal that we did work together the Gardnerians and, and uh, Alexandrians worked together so that's when I actually uh, had a chat with uh, Lady Barra 
who's, uh, I'm sure you know, um, is an Alexandrian uh, high priestess. Um, and I said to her, you know, would you like to, uh, would you, you know, do this together? We'd been to one of the conferences in, in England, uh, the PF conferences, actually the one where um, Patricia Crowther spoke. And um, so we were very, very interested in the whole PF concept. So actually Lady Barra and I decided to man or whatever chair uh, P uh, PFI Netherlands so that's when we actually started and that was 1997 so uh, late late 90s yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and then um, as things happen um, we had at the time I think an email list yeah I saw a Yahoo list at the time um, Tony had actually had contacts also because he was also in in, in uh, Wicca. He was uh, he later uh, created his own tradition, Children of the Light, um, yes, and yes. had um, people in France and later in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, so we started taking sort of inventory of where where we got contacts now we had contacts with people in canada also in australia at the time and also portugal and brazil so uh that's those were the early days of pfi uh but by 1999 tony decided to to resign uh, there were a couple of uh attacks and you, you know how things go there was a lot of misunderstandings and uh, he said he, he, he really wasn't interested in the politics so he decided to to uh, uh, resign and I said well what's going to happen you know uh, I've got these 25 members or Lady Baron yes. and I've got 25 members in the Netherlands what are we going to do what are we going to do <laughs> so I said well I don't mind being interim international coordinate, coordinator just to, to, to get us through the summer to keep it, yes, to keep it just to, to keep things sticking over <laughs> and that was like 1999 and until <laughs> <I'm> now <laughs> until now yeah I still you know I've got uh, a few um, yes interim for me was, was uh, quite a flexible term in the end but, now, um, I, want, I wanted to clarify a little bit because, you know, the, uh, the show is, is seen by people in, in the United States also. And, you know, um, sometimes it's very different from, you know, all, all of the people in Europe know PFI. And, you know, and, and people in the chat room was like, PFI, Pagan Federation? Yes, it is Pagan Federation. And this, is, uh, this was set in England. And then, you know, Pagan Federation International was, was uh, handed up to you because you wanted to kind of, you know... <laughs> keep it going by the, for the mm -hmm, summer mm -hmm, yep. until today so that summer is a long summer now um i wanted to know um i wanted to for you to tell us a little bit of you know a very short version of what it is the pagan federation international or the pagan federation and what they do um because um you know i know that you have a coordinator in in the united states um, some other countries do s some some events. Uh, it's not the case of the United States, uh, but you know th there is a contact in the United States that people can actually yes, that's correct. Yeah. Kind of, yes, yes. Yeah. So, can you tell us a little bit more about Pagan Federation? Just very you know short definition, which is quite hard, but you know I'm sure that you can well, do well, it. <laughs> the the mission statement is to defend the rights of pagans. Yes. And basically, uh, the Pagan Federation started off as an activist uh, campaigning organization, uh, in fact, to act uh, um, to uh, the anti defamation work was one of the, the, the major reasons for it actually to be um, uh, established. When, when in the 1970s in, in England, of course, there was still a lot of. Uh, uh, disinformation or uh, misinformation about witchcraft, um, about mm -hmm. other pagan uh, customs, etc. So the first, the early days um, were actually to basically to uh, provide correct information about paganism. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that is still for PF International, still one of our major uh, jobs actually is to where there is misinformation is to give correct information um, and also to help people, pagans in, in all over the world to you know be able to talk to us to, to so networking is an, an, an extremely important part of our work. 
just to let people feel they're not actually uh, completely on their own. On their own. Mm -hmm. So this is still one of the basic uh, ideas behind PFI that mm -hmm. we we still try to bring people together to exchange ideas to <clears throat> sorry to to um, basically support each other. And if people mm -hmm. really really have problems mm -hmm. um, where they feel that there is discrimination, then um, we try to help by giving. Uh, correct information by um, talking to in some cases talking to academics in some cases talking to the press um, but we, we try to help people say look you know th th this is a very good book um, this, this can help you to um, understand a little bit more about what paganism what Wicca is what Druidism is so we're still very much into the activist uh, um, side of things I always hope that people will take an active role in PFI so, you know you don't have to be a member um, but uh, unfortunately you know um, we still live in a consumer society so a lot of people mm -hmm. still see us very much as you know what have you got to offer and I said no it's actually you know, what have you you know what do you really want so we try to um, keep up with what people want and need and, and, and try to yes. answer those, those questions yeah. now Pagan Federation is also um, a publication right it's magazine is it uh, yes, the, the, the yes. PF, Pagan PF Dawn? has Pagan Dawn, Pagan Dawn is, is um, yes. it was originally uh, the Wiccan, and I think yes. it was about 1994 that it be actually became uh, Pagan, Pagan Dawn. Dawn. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. So members, if you are um, you know interested in being a member of Pagan Federation, you you do have the possibility of receiving the Pagan Dawn, which is one of the things that you can actually do. Yes, um, and and the other thing is events. There's a lot of people and coordinators around the world that do events um, for Pagan Federation members also, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. sometimes for the community in general. It's just not just for the members it themselves. It's just open to the public, to the you know. Oh yes, the community. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I should it, just it's add. Very interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, I should just Sorry. add at the moment. Um, the the concept of PFI um, mm. is is basically what I've tried to do al along with other people, of course, is to act in a very organic way um, as to people it's you know we are pagans and the way we actually organize ourselves um, should also reflect our pagan ideals so a lot of the for me PFI is very much an organic organization sort of organic org 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 um, but what I, I try to emphasize to people coming into PFI is that the PFI nations have a great deal of autonomy and they can react very quickly to the local situation. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, we very quickly decided that um, membership with Pagan Dawn was perhaps not the best thing for people who live in Portugal or Spain or who, who, who don't have English as their first language. So we introduced the membership without Pagan Dawn, so membership only, mm -hmm. and also tried to, in, in 2006, uh, at the time, PFI was still a district of the Paying Federation. But in 2006, we did actually split from Paying Federation because we actually had our own foundation. We um, established a foundation uh, in, in the Netherlands. And then we started organizing ourselves by having the foundation in the Netherlands. But then from the foundation, we'd actually start saying, okay, if there are enough people in Germany who would like to be uh, PFI German, that's fine. They would be part of Paying Federation International, but would also have uh, their own, you know, say in how they actually ran their own country. Now, by that time, we had quite a few countries already, including Portugal, and mm -hmm. uh, I think Spain was already on, on board. No, no the, yes, it was already on board. And as we actually grew, it was also what does each country need, and, and why? How can we actually? Um, facilitate yes. some countries already had a couple of pagan organizations but most countries especially in central and eastern europe didn't really have any organized organizations or structure or, or um what have you so a lot of the events in the beginning were just basically uh um pop moots just yes. to get people to talk and and, and just uh um, exchange ideas. Mm -hmm. We'd already had in, uh, I think it was, we were on to our 12th anniversary this year, 2000 was our first, no, 2001 
was our first conference in the Netherlands. And that's always been the major international uh, conference. As I said, it's, next week is going to be our 12th anniversary. Um, but I, 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 I do try and encourage countries to have their own conferences. So we, we have all kinds of events, really, from pod moods to days out, uh, together to picnics to um, full-blown conferences so it, it, it depends where you are and how many people are interested um, mm-hmm. and, and really what what is actually possible so now, it's, it's quite a, an, a range of uh, and a, you know, diversity in, 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 in activities yeah which is a great it's which is a great thing now um, oh I'm not I'm not I'm green again <laughs> did you see me I'm green you know, oh, and very, no. very, yes, very red. Oh, there you go. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another thing is that um, uh, the, 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 I, I wanted to talk to you about Pagan Federation, but I also wanted to talk to you about, you know, what happens in, in where I am, which is, <laughs> and I'm being, you know, uh, a little bit, um, y- you know, uh, I, I'm kind of talking about my own thing. Well, but it is, it, you know, I'm, I'm in America. So, um, yes. I know the reality of Portugal. They're doing a fantastic job in Portugal uh, with Isabel and 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 mm-hmm. uh, Jose as as the um, international coordinators for, for Portugal. Um, but uh, what about what about America? Do you know anything about America? Can you tell us a little th- a little bit about America? Mm-hmm. Yes, um, of course. Uh, if you if you look at uh, Wicca, um, certainly in the um, early seventies, then many many things were going on in the United Kingdom, and of course later. Uh, things were more or more simultaneously happening in the United States. Yeah. So um, when the Pagan Federation started in, in uh, England, um, we already had contacts with American friends, but there was no real um, affiliation or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, in 1980, um, Merlin and I started very seriously with Wicca in the Netherlands. So in a, in a sense, you had three real main areas of... Um, expansion if you like so it was the United Kingdom the US and the Netherlands and to some extent also Germany Germany mm-hmm. came on board mm-hmm. fairly mm-hmm. quickly with Wicca um, so by the time PFI was actually up and running if you like um, there was I mean there were so many things happening in, in America I mean we, I had I also had a long contact with Selena from uh, Circle uh, and, mm-hmm. and, um, and Dennis uh, and also from Covenant of Goddess and fairly you know quite a lot of people also in Canada so yes. when we said it would be quite nice to have something in America it was more or less okay Selena you're doing all the stuff in America the Children of the Goddess you're doing all the stuff in America um, what we can offer is the international side and that really came to a head in 2004 when we all met at the World Parliament, and that was at that time held in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, um, I went as a a PFI rep uh, and met the US pagans, which was a a, a contingent of about 60 people. And for the first time, I met people like Selena, and in fact, Selena and Michael York and I headed a panel about international paganism. Mm -hmm. And that was quite interesting because uh, Selena said it, 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 she thought the concept of PFI was wonderful she said because you, you really have got the idea of although you're working internationally the PFI nations are working locally yes. so for her it was it was a good way if I need anything international I'll get hold of Morgana and I said if I need to know anything about the American scene I can get hold of Selena so hey you've already got a networking so I yes. said that's fine <laughs> um, but there were a couple of people who, who were interested in Pagan Dawn, so we set up PFI um, uh, yeah, USA, and yeah, at that time it was Michael Thorne who was our national coordinator. And of course, my history with Michael um, was also went way, way, way back into uh, mid, I think, the mid eighties when I first yeah. uh, Michael was here in, in Europe. And uh, so we're I met talking him. About, we're talking about Michael Thorne de Gardnier and Michael Thorne, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. I think that there is only one Michael Thorne well, that I, I, I know, exactly. that <laughs> I know of. <laughs> well, I'm talking yes. about, I mean, the, these are people who, who are, you know, yeah. um, uh, very, very well known within their own uh, yes, they are. Within yes. the community, of yes. course, and the yes. of God, the goddess. And uh, so we were all mates. I mean, we were all, we were all 
very, very good friends, you know, and um, because at that time, the Wicca community was so tiny. I mean, we, we could, you know, you could yeah. count the high priestesses on, on, on two hands, you know, and we didn't need to know who was, was initiated by whom, you know, if you, knew, you knew this... Yes, Pardon? you knew. You knew. You, you knew. knew. People, yeah. you, exactly. You just knew. You, you, and you knew yeah. by the way they taught. You could just ask a couple of questions. And you didn't even really need to have anybody to be vouched for because we just knew. If they knew that person, then that they must have been initiated. Mm. But, of course, as things changed. And um, as, as Wicca really, really exploded, um, it became more and more difficult to actually keep... Uh, really track of who was who and and PFI was a good way again for Wiccans and pagans in America to communicate with uh, people in in Europe so I said you know PFI USA we didn't really need to have members in those terms but what we did need to do is to have some sort of visibility that we would also be there if we wanted to know about uh, Europe or uh, the international scene then we could be a, a very good partner so um, Link, who is now the current NC, is also uh, initiated. So, you know, we're still all very much good friends. And that's what I still try to emphasize about the whole... The, 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 to me, the pagan community, we still really need to encourage this sense of community. Mm -hmm. And even though um, we may have our differences, I think the similarities are enough to say to, get, to people, look, whatever happens... You know, we are a community, and we should be a little bit forgiving about if people, you know, make blunders. We all make blunders. So, in a way, PFI was also saying, you know, there are lots of people in in in, in the UK and uh, Europe who are also also working on the spiritual side of paganism, the spiritual side of Wicca, and it was very good to have people in America we could also talk to. So that was, as I say, America's always been like England um, not so much a place where we need to you know act as missionaries because <laughs> I mean that, that was not exactly the idea anyway yeah. but we, we were talking as equal as, as partners actually so and that's yeah, always been the yeah. case yeah now you do have also um, uh, a, a fantastic coordinator in Brazil which is a wonderful thing also because you know Brazil is just the other the other side of the Latin America and it's a uh -huh. huge huge country Absolutely. Um, with yeah, yeah. huge, you know, adherence to not only Wicca, but other, you know, uh, even syncretic, you know, religions mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. in Brazil. Yes. And we have the Candomblé yeah. and we have all of those yeah. things. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's amazing that, you know, how, you know, looking now back uh, to the 80s, where, where all of this started, are you happy mm -hmm. with the result? Am I happy with the result? Yes, of all of these <laughs> nucleus <laughs> <is> of, <laughs> well, <were> spread <laughs> throughout the world. Um, I, I said what to everybody, think? look, I'm still yeah. alive. I'm still happy. Yeah. I, I, I'm still very enthusiastic <laughs> about being uh, uh, um, uh, a witch, uh, about mm. being a Wiccan priestess. Um, somebody said to me recently, um, you should actually uh, advertise that how young you are. You know, don't don't go for a detox cure. Just become a Wiccan. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely. Well, but it does. You know, I, <laughs> I was talking with people in America, a few, you know, a few initiates in America, you know, and um, a few uh, priestesses, and and it's amazing. People, you know, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> High priestesses of Wicca do not grow old. They don't. <laughs> They don't. I think we. It's I think we amazing. start old. I think we start old, and then we get younger. <laughs> exactly. You go backwards. It's just amazing. Um, yes, we, we should come up with a product, like you know, like some some campaign about you know just be initiated. That's it. There's nothing else to it. Yeah. Um, and the same thing to the there is a serious. I mean, the, you know, sorry, there is a serious thing. side to that, though. Um, I, I I still try to to emphasize to a lot of people. You know, it can be hard work, but if you really feel that you um, are willing to go for the long haul, then and you follow the, the seasons and you follow the uh, natural cycles, then there are a lot of things you can actually also discover about yourself. And you know that there are going to be moments which are, are difficult, but 
if you look at how nature solves a lot of problems and, and take nature as being your your uh, f um, source of inspiration, mm -hmm. then there's also so much you can um, derive which gives you pleasure. Um, and so it's always this, this kind of two-way communication. I say, if you, if you listen to what the gods are telling you, if you really try to... to um, put it into practice and, and by that I mean actually you know for me it's, it is a way of life it isn't just something oh, that yes. I practice yeah, you know no. once a month yes. or when the moon is full and all the rest of it <laughs> to me it's it is going to work and, and making making uh, sure that you, your life is in order that you um, have you know you, you really have your feet on the ground you know I said it, it's it's a path of uh, the hearth fire a lot of us have uh, children families jobs we need to pay the mortgages and it's no good um thinking it's all going to be done by magic no uh, i i use magic very very rarely i say you know common sense is the thing that i i hope i use most of my time you know rather than i don't need magic in that sense magic is something to me which i'm doing all the time if you like so the way we actually react um the way we interact also with our community is for me a very important part of the whole Wicca concept and of course there are moments when we need to reflect there are moments when I think you know what am I doing you know I'm this is terrible or awful or I'm just not getting the results I, I want or how come things are being misunderstood so the whole Wicca philosophy for me is also a way for me to be able to actually reflect and say you know what is happening and really have a, a talk with myself uh, I, I said to a lot of people it's not just a talk with the gods but you're actually trying to have a, a, a running conversation with yourself well how do I see this what am I doing but to be really able to communicate not get not only with yourself but so with the gods and with the community around you and I think that does keep you young because it keeps you active it reminds you of those things which you dreamt about those ideals you had when you were young and also the ideas you had about spirituality and mm -hmm. you know you you were talking about my my book there's actually um probably my my book you know beyond the broomstick is a very good example um in 2008 a friend of mine was going into um publishing and she said um have you got something in english which i could publish and i said well i've written lots and lots of articles of course for wick and raid but I had never really thought about writing a book. But I said, well, you know, there's a, a series of articles uh, which I headed under uh, a series called Beyond the Broomstick. So she said, well, that sounds really good. I said, well, you can use it just for um, uh, a tryout, really. Uh, I said, I wrote them, you know, it was a series I wrote in about the 19, about 1980 uh, in, in the early editions of Wiccan Raid. I said, but it was written when I'd just been initiated. Um, I was trying to to also figure out for myself what was important about Wicca, what helped me to uh, figure out why it was my path, what it had to offer, what I had to offer, etc. The only problem was I completely lost, <laughs> completely lost the English edition. We had translated it into or Dennis or Merlin had translated it in 1982, and it came out in, in Holland as Twee um, out Basem. Uh, which we'd been using for the last 20 years as a, a, a booklet. But we, we I, I finally managed to find the uh, English text and a friend of mine typed it over and we actually published it as this book. But at the time, Anna-Marie said to me, do you want to revise it? And, you know, I, I read through it and I thought, you know, if I was to revise this book into an internet period, an, inter an age of internet and all the information, so much of it would probably be lost because the, the beauty of that series was there was me as an enthusiastic priestess but you know when I read it I thought those ideas that enthusiasm has just never left it's just the same I could have written that book yesterday in fact I wrote it 30 years ago but it really really hasn't changed and I thought you know this has really stood the test of time at least in my eyes it had so I said to oh, Anna Marie absolutely let's you know just go with it i'll update the bibliography um i'll look at a couple of uh, i'll write a, a forward um i'll look at the introduction 
see if there are any real, real changes. But the basic text, I think I should just leave as an unrevised uh, uh, text. And that's what, exactly what we did. It's and, and amazing First how many people... Th- Sorry? Th- let me just say this. This is a, a fantastic... Well, it's, it's, it's a beautiful book. First of all, I love the cover. And you can see that it becomes transparent when you, when yes. you show it. Do you see that? So yes, it's yes. Etheric. It's the etheric knowledge. <laughs> Coming transparent. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's, well, it's, it's not we all have actually, but it's it is like I you know, said. Sometimes it's not always apparent. No, it's not no, always no, 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 apparent. No, no, not at all. This is a small book, but it's it's it, you know, and if you look at it, it looks it's a very cute little book. But I think that it's a very big book because it has things in it that um, I think that any prospect student should should read. Um, you have Thank things you. on polarity, which is the big. <laughs> it's the big thing nowadays. Mm-hmm. Polarity is very, it's very big, and it's not because it is you know something new. It's actually not. I mean, Gartner knew that in in fifty two, or you know, um, mm-hmm. it, it's really not about if it is new. It is. A, a different point of view nowadays we have a different point of view of, of polarity with all of the things that happened I mean in 52 nobody would think about doing a transgender or, or something you know mm-hmm. like, you know something so polarity nowadays it's looking at it in a different perspective now um, but we are talking about and I wanted to say this but I, I really love to hear you and I wanted to interrupt you we're talking about tra- traditional uh, Wicca you know opposed to eclectic Wicca or any other kind of Wicca. We're mm-hmm. talking about Gardnerian Alexandria, and you actually said that. Um, and, and this book probably had to do with that also, um, with, with traditional Wicca, and the concepts of traditional Wicca. Now, you have here polarity, for instance, the first thing that you actually write about. Um, and you, you very beautifully put it, um, and, and very clearly pu- put it here, and it's absolutely amazing. So very often people asked me, you know, and even students and, 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 and prospect students, uh, wh- how, how do you see polarity? Do I have to, you know, do I have to, you know, so there's a lot of things about polarity that are um, interesting nowadays that mm-hmm. people are looking at polarity, you know, with all of these, you know, acceptance of uh, all these kinds of genders and there's this kind of definitions and new definitions of gender and all of that. But mm-hmm. I think that when we talk about traditional Wicca, we do have to define it and we do have to confine it because there is there are some things that you know uh, they are what they are and they worked for so many years you know Mm -hmm. that are not really going to you know they're not adjustable one of the things that you know i really think that it's very brave is when when you you just kind of you know talk about it and and polarity is one of them now uh, how what what is your vision about polarity in in the context of of your book and the context Mm -hmm. of, of traditional wicca yeah um, for me, polarity is, um, I always say to people, it's not for me an absolute duality. Mm. If you consider that um, much of our being, being humans, but also a part of nature, is, is um, based on duality, you know, we have north mm. and south, east and west, the concept of polarity is actually very, very uh, inherent in our whole being. Um, polarity is, for me, expresses two extremities where Mm -hmm. within that those extremities you have many many uh, nuances so Mm -hmm. if you're talking about black and white you then have all the different shades of gray in between and uh, for me when we talk about the law of polarity is actually to find in answer to questions is to find not so much balance but also but to actually find harmony what Mm -hmm. is harmonious between two extremes which is the point where you feel intuitive quite in quite often as to what is actually harmonious Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. so by understanding what on what black is and understanding what white is then we can also begin to understand what actually harmony is all about sometimes we Mm -hmm. do need a little bit of black in the white and sometimes we need a little bit of white in the black Mm -hmm. but it's always this flux between the two extremes Um, so for me polarity is not specifically gender based at all in fact it's uh, one of the um, things about polarity which is 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 one of the sort of spin-offs you know you 
if you talk about hot, cold, black, white, and then we come to the big one, love, hate. Mm -hmm. And I say to people, when you understand or try to understand the extremes, then it does then give you an idea of what all the different, as I say, all the different gradations are, are about. So when we start talking about man, man, woman, the, the man, woman polarity, male, yes. female polarity, mm -hmm. I, I remind people that none of us are all male and none of us are all female. We're all of us something in between. And by discovering for ourselves the place where we feel the most comfortable and where we can react and interact is for me something that we can use the law of polarity to to help us to navigate you know to, to really navigate between these two extremes but that's that's with all aspects of polarity that's why i think the law of polarity is so important it's a way of actually helping us to navigate between perhaps two extremes and when you talk about ethics you know this is very important to be able to say i understand i understand the black i understand the white i understand the hate the love i understand the black or, or the hot and cold because you then start seeing the greater picture and right. I don't think mm -hmm. you can really talk about relationships. You can't really talk about gender unless you really are able to understand, you know, the extremes. So, although I could say, you know, I'm heterosexual and I have a very strong um, connection, you know, I like men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't feel attracted to women, but there's a part of me which says, of course I feel attracted to women. It's just that in the sexuality, probably I would choose a man first. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. to say, oh, I don't find women sexually attractive. Mm -hmm. But I just, mm -hmm. so it's, I, I don't think you can, you can, you know, just use, it's, it's always a question of labeling and people want to label things as, you know, nature doesn't label things. It's human beings label things. We give people uh, tags. We, we, we do that mm -hmm. even on internet. We, we talk about tagging people, tagging this, tagging that. To me, that is really, in a way, a shame. It's, mm -hmm. it's such a shame that we, we have to, but it's it's human. We need to be able to find our base. We need to be able to tell a story. You know, our brains mm -hmm. need to say, this is a beginning, this is a middle, and this is an end. And mm -hmm. the law of polarity, in a way, helps you to, to see the bigger picture, to see the whole story. And sometimes we see this particular angle, another time we see another angle. And, and for me, again, polarity is actually not even just linear. It's very much um, a circular uh, thing as well so mm -hmm. you don't just have east east west but north south and then when we start realizing that it's actually uh so um enormous that uh when we do start trying to understand how people react how magic works then we can be at any point on on those axes you know and for me it's always been a way of helping me to map out where i am Mm -hmm. Where am I at the moment? Am I left or right or up or down? And it helps me in a way to to um, find my bearings. But I don't see the law of polarity as actually um, a way of, um, you know, quantifying something or saying because this, this and this and this, that has to be the conclusion. No, it's only an opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said mm -hmm. to people, you know, it's not... Um, an absolute uh, duality truth as well is not uh, something which I think is absolute I have a lot of arguments with with um, you know the academic world especially from Christian backgrounds who talk about absolute truth I said you know 99% of the people can say the pen I have in my hand now is blue and I might say no it's green and I may represent 1% of the people who think my pen is green and the other 99% think it's blue now because 99% of the people think it's blue it does not mean to me to say it really is blue mm -hmm. you know what I mean it's yeah. it's always very very subjective and yeah. if people would start realizing that everything we do and how we interpret the world and how we see the world is from a very subjective point of view then perhaps we would be a little bit more open to the opinions of other people and I think that's where we can really start doing some real magic mm -hmm. uh, until we understand that the way we perceive the world is only the way we perceive the world 
then perhaps we can be a little bit more open to the uh, opinions and, and, and actually the insights of other people. So to me, the law of polarity helps me to also understand, mm, perhaps somebody sees it slightly different, perhaps they're more to the left of the, uh, the, the, the sliding scale, if you like, and I can understand that because their background is this, this and this and this. So it also helps me to understand where other people are coming from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the beauty of it all, of course, is once you decide, you know, you, ha you have black and white or w w warm and cold and all that. I, I talk about the, the two in, um, or the three in one aspects yeah. uh, or concept. You have two things and out of those two things, there, there is a third thing which arises, which is, is not, it, it, the, the two poles themselves actually create the possibility of a new thing actually being formed so in other words when we talk about polarity when we allow it to actually um, germinate if you like their ideas then we're actually able to say that something new is created out of something which was which existed before but it is a sort of continuity so mm. whatever is new has also got a little bit of what they actually brought with them well of course we know that because we, if we look at um, when a, a baby is born, we know that genetically the, a, a baby takes a bit from, from the father, a bit from the mother, but also from all the ancestors, from the whole of human, the human race, you know, the yes. species. Yeah. Yeah. So even when we look at our own genetic makeup, we cannot say we're with this or that. We, we're a complete mixture and, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I think it's absolutely amazing how it's... The diversity is is just um, unending. So for me, the law of polarity is really has been the key to actually understanding how diverse how diverse our our universe, how our world really really is. And you know that's why I come into the where I I, I love the way that the chaos magicians really view the world because it really is you know everything's possible. Time yeah. has as a huge uh, possibility we, we're not stuck in a, a two or even three dimensional world we have many many possibilities of actually seeing the world from from very very different angles so I think um, when we come away from this this um, uh, idea of having to label everything we just free ourselves and and then we can really fly and that's when I said that that's when you can really start seeing how how the world really really works and how the gods mm -hmm. and, and uh, nature really actually can give us many many um, insights now you do have uh, other things on, on your book I mean I'm just going to go through the contents the table of contents is polarity the goddess uh, and then you have the maiden, mother, and crone, and then you have the god, the four elements, and in practice, and then the epilogue. So, yeah. <clears throat> I love the in practice thing, because, um, you know, I love all of them, uh, mm -hmm. because you go th throughout all of, the, all of the, you know, especially deity, it's absolutely amazing, and then you go through the aspects of the, you know, of the goddess, uh, and you go, and you go through uh, all, all of the things about the god, and, and you really, it's just beautiful, the, the, the invocation of the horn god by Doreen Valiente that you, you know, mm, you. Yeah. Tomorrow. it's just absolutely amazing. Yeah. I like um, and then, I, I just love it. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and, and you have also the four elements so everything that in in this book, it's really it's really uh, the basics, you know, to understand the basics um, and to glance onto the basics of the craft, and it's just very mm -hmm. very uh, absolutely amazing. And then you do have the bi bibliography so that people can actually you know, refer mm -hmm. yes. to yeah, yeah. for the reading if they want to. Now the the other thing is that I really love the in practice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Chapter. I'm, I'm just going to look. Yeah, yeah. Um, because to, to me, oh, sorry, oh, it's okay. Oh, wait, wait. We love cell phones. Yeah, <laughs> we're more than witches. <laughs> we really do love cell phones. <laughs> um, to me, to me, the, the the craft is very, very pragmatic. For me, it's always been a way. If mm. I can't use what I'm learning um, in my daily life, to me, it has no. I'm not saying it has no value, but it has no real place. You know, I, I have to be able to say, I have a problem, I need to solve it, God help me, give me some inspiration or whatever. And uh, so the practical side, and actually I'm going to start saying something now, which is some of the traditional 
uh, people may not like, but um, <laughs> to me, traditional witchcraft is very, very eclectic. And Gerald Gardner is to me one of the most eclectic people I've ever come across. Um, and I always say to people, I, I feel as if I am treading in, in Gardner's footsteps by actually looking at different cultures, looking at different uh, folk traditions. I think what Gerald Gardner really helped us and, and certainly helped me to understand was um, if we want to really connect with the land, then we really need to look at the cultural side. We need to look at uh, the deities, the, the nature spirits of all the, you know, the, the, the various parts of the, the world. And of course, each part of the world and has different cultures, but even the cultural side of it is very important to actually understanding the people and understanding how the people have uh, interacted with the nature around them. So when when I started, you know, looking at what Gerald Gardner had actually done, um, and he of course was in um, uh, Malaysia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was quite funny because I said, you know, I, that what my idea was got going to India, <laughs> yes, and then find out that Gerald Gardner also <laughs> had a lot to do with, with Malaysia and, yeah, and the old yeah. English, uh, the British Empire, and all the rest of it. I thought, hmm, how strange, how coincidental. <laughs> And then I started looking at what he was actually looking at. And of course, he was looking at animism. He was looking at folk tradition. And for me, in the early, certainly when I was initiated, um, for me, it was also very important to to really see what the local, yeah, in a way, what the local practices are. To me, the craft is a craft. It's something you actually do. You don't just talk about it. You actually live it and do it. So it's, uh, the practice has always been for me absolutely uh uh, paramount. I said, you know, I'm not an intellectual. I'm a, just a simple witch. I just like, I just love life, and I'm very curious. And if you're very curious, it, it means that you get in some really strange situations. <laughs> and <laughs> that's <but> true. <laughs> you, al you also yes. learn if you if you really look at how people have coped with different climates or different landscapes, then you learn ever such a lot. Um, and uh, you know, for me, it's always how can I adapt to a certain situation? And unfortunately, most of our human development is how can we make, or how how can we make nature adapt to us? And I think that's mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it. Was a kind of flawed concept. How mm -hmm. come we didn't immediately start saying, if we need food, how much food do we actually need? You know, why should we go on, you know, create, you know, acres and acres of grain and all the rest of it when we only needed so much? Or why did we have so many cows when we only needed, a, you know, a couple of uh, steaks or what have you? I, I was always mm -hmm. fascinated by how come human nature has always tried to fit nature into, you know, our situation. But then I started realizing, but human nature is nature. So what was it to adapt? So it, it was a, it was a, a bit of a paradox, really. And I realised that what what Gerald Gardner had actually done, he was he was really looking at how people cope with life. So to me, the craft has always been to do with life. How do we actually survive? How do we survive the storm? How do we survive the, the bad harvests? So um, of life. The band has yes. So the how band how has, do yes. we how do we actually cope? How do we? Um, and of course, if we learn from our elders, if, if we learn from our ancestors, then perhaps we can actually, you know, progress. And I mean progression in the sense of what are the gods actually telling us? What are, what is is the earth? What is Mother Earth actually telling us? How can we, as human beings, evolve and become more aware and that's always been a, a really important part of my whole quest in, in in a sense is what are the gods actually telling us what 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 are we here for what are we who are we as human beings um and for me gerald Gardner was always a, a really you know a guiding light i uh, say so, you know he's a, he's a luminary he's not a saint he he, he did he, he wasn't uh, somebody who he, he did loads of things which you know, I think, yeah, that's really kind of human. And maybe he, he was a bit 
um, what we call it, um, it's a bit of poetic license, you know, but mm -hmm. how many of us deal with poetry? How many de of, de of us deal with fantasy? And I said, you know, we do have this word bewitched. There is a lot of glamoury. We do have ways of seducting people and making things look better and more fascinating. But isn't that also part of the gifts we have? You know, the wonders of life. How do we make, how do we keep that fascination going? Because via that fascination, we become more involved with what's going on around us. And I'm really very, very gr grateful that, you know, somebody like Gerald Gardner was courageous enough to actually, you know, bring it out. But there were many, many other people who were courageous enough to do that. The whole hippie movement, there were a lot of people who were willing to experiment with drugs and all the rest of it and paid heavily for it. You know, I, I don't dispute how much... You know those those early pioneers who were you know dealing with drugs you know psychedelic drugs and all the rest of it to find out a more mystical side of life um but this is this is part and parcel of, of you know the the post-war years and you know, the sexual sexual revolution oh absolutely yeah it's a free oh, it's, kind it's of you know yeah yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely so, it's it's this this sentiment of freedom i want to free myself i want to free my mind i will not cons constrain my mind to this mm -hmm. you know war kind of political thing i just want to love people and you know so you know love becomes very important in that time because of that and i think that we do yes. need a little bit more love today because i think oh yes we forget yeah I'm... about it a lot a lot, often lots you know so yeah mm -hmm. it's it's very interesting now one of the things that i want to talk to you about it's the goddess and mm -hmm. the god obviously and you know you you do have extensive um oh see uh, I think that was Master Nestor that said that this was the ghost book. Yeah, because it's ghost transparent. Book. <laughs> yeah, it's transparent. See how transparent it is? Okay, okay. <laughs> he said it was transparent. So um, uh, I, want, I wanted to uh, ask you about that because there's several, you know, opinions, and I'm sure that this is your personal opinion, you know, um, when, you, when you talk about that because, you know, there, there's a, there is a definition of the goddess and the god, but, you know, it's very personal because we perceived as humans, we perceive it differently. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, yes. You know, it's a, it's it's really a personal experience. Uh, but yes. if you had to explain to somebody, and this happened to me quite often, you know, um, that I have friends that are not, you know, witches at all. They they don't have any clue whatsoever. And I actually had mm -hmm. a friend yesterday that had no clue whatsoever. And you know, I live in Salem, so it's kind of you know, we every time that someone comes up um, to visit, we the the thing that we do is that we take them to the tour of the witch shops because that's what mm -hmm. we do <laughs> you know, it's just like yeah, let's, yeah. let's see do. the witch shop um and it it's quite overwhelming because there's so many um and and how do you explain god and goddess to to someone that doesn't really have a clue um now pretend that i'm someone that i don't have a clue well, no it's no it's part of, it's <laughs> part of my um my my work in, in fact um yes as, as pfi yeah. of course um, absolutely yes Yes. I I'm asked occasionally to to come and talk about Wicca, and um, yes. I have done also Wicca workshops. Um, what I, I I try first of all is, for example, when I was in in Turkey or in Hungary, I would say to people, look, you have here a pagan heritage, which is probably much older even than than where I come from from the British Isles. So I actually go and ask people, first of all, how they feel connected to their own landscape, their own land. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, quite often I start some of these workshops with actually, first of all, um, a question that to the people I'm actually uh, with. And I try to take them back into childhood memories. How, how did you celebrate spring? How did you celebrate the winter? And we do... A simple meditation and mm -hmm. it's amazing how many people suddenly start remembering how they saw the world as a child and they will remember things like the perfume their grandmother used to wear or the meals that their mother used to make and all sorts of memories start coming out and then they'll mention 
the invisible friends, the their mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. helpers, or somebody will come up and say, you know, I used to to go out and I'd see the moon and. I remember a dance or, or something and then you start realizing there are lots and lots of folk memories coming through so I said to, to people hold those memories and try and start seeing them as an adult now and of course what happens is that people start realizing that they've never really lost that what I try to emphasize is that many of us as children have contact have experiences with what we would later call gods and goddesses or nature spirits but quite often as adults we're actually told that's all you know uh you know crazy or what have you and we have to in many ways repress what we learned as as children mm -hmm. now what i'm saying is uh when i'm going into depth about this how i talk to people in in europe and um even recently in Panama, is that the gods, to me, have actually arisen from what we would also call uh, nature spirits. If you look at um, the, the sort of ancient connections with the land, the, the, uh, if you look at the artifacts we have, and especially um, figurines, especially the female figurines, I, I came across one recently in, in Bratislava. It was an absolutely amazing little torso it was definitely a woman because the breasts were actually asymmetrical which is very common amongst women mm -hmm. and the back was beautifully and you know I looked at it and I just could not believe my eyes it was about three centimeters high and it was a mammoth tooth and it was 33,000 years old old wow and you know I I say to people, we don't have to talk about uh, gods and goddesses as if we just discovered them. You know, the the way that people have actually observed and seen and actually noted or made carvings or drawings or whatever probably testify to the fact that that um, we always have had a connection. And of course, that's, that's absolutely true. If you look at the archetypal, you know, the first thing we, 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 we remember as, as, as a baby when we're born is the human face, you know, mm -hmm. and usually it's the face of our mothers. So there are lots and lots of archetypal things where I say it's, it's part and parcel of our human condition. So when I talk about the goddess or God, I actually say, you know, just think about how you see your mother and father, how you see those people who have actually helped you or have given you strength, but also those those personifications, if you like, who've actually shed the shit out of you as well. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. that is part and parcel as well of understanding the world around us. Fear is something that was also given to us to make sure that we actually survive, you know, this fight and flight mm -hmm. aspect. So again, in the forest, we would be confronted with things that we were actually really shit scared of. So when we talk about gods and goddesses, when I say, what do you feel is very close to you? Then people start realizing that there is something which is, that they could call a mother or could call a father. But mm -hmm. I, I don't like saying to people, you have to see you know uh, this particular form or that particular form I leave that completely open and I still like to say to people how you actually see the gods how you see nature spirits is something which everybody needs to discover for themselves and I really mm -hmm. don't even like defining or even telling people what I've seen because to me Wicca is and it is uh, foremost a mystery religion it isn't a goddess religion. It isn't a nature religion. It's all of them. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But the mystery, mm -hmm. the first time mystical experience is to me so important. And I think it's uh, actually sad if we as uh, Wiccan teachers take away that mystery. So I always start with, when I'm doing any, any, I don't really like calling it teaching either. I like saying I like to guide people to that particular experience so when i talk about gods and goddesses i don't even like talking about my own deities 
if, if I'm pushed for it, I will. But um, <laughs> the way I discovered uh, my deities were, were actually by interacting with myself. I start with myself. What do I need? How do I, you know, I, I, I need help. And suddenly I remembered when I was a child that I did have helpers. Um, and my mother said, you know, I, I was always a very, very happy child. And, and, and she said that, that people often thought I had these invisible friends. And I thought, well, they weren't invisible to me. <laughs> you know, they were like, what are they talking about? <laughs> they were absolutely visible to me. But it's, it's the way children see the world. And I think if we as adults can remember how we saw the world as children, we would suddenly also realize that, that those deities have always been with us. But it's actually becoming older and adult that we've actually been forced in many, many ways to actually forget those very early experiences. So again, talking about gods and goddesses, I, I try to keep it fairly open. I don't like def defining because mm -hmm. everybody should have uh, their own way of interacting and also actually for themselves discovering what god, goddess means to them. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. No, absolutely, it does, it does. Now the other important bits of it is is the, the elements. Um, oftentimes people just you know, because it's so concentrated on the gods and and you know, especially the goddess. You know, it's just mm -hmm. you know, you just said you know, it's not really a religion of the goddess. It's a mystery religion. It's just um, the elements are. I, I so think it important. was just. I, th I think what happened in the in the nineties because uh, there were more people who became more aware of of uh, a, a, an alternative form of spirituality. Yeah. It was much mm -hmm. more nature based. That there was a natural swing towards the feminine side, so I think in you know I, I understand why there was um, the goddess movement. It was a, and again again a kind of natural reaction to a patriarchal uh, you know system. Uh, again, I'm not anti-Christian, but you know th there were lots of things that that women were just not allowed to do. We were just not allowed to be well priestesses for a start, you know, <laughs> I mean, <Yeah>. duh, <laughs> um, and <laughs> so. I, I think it's a, it's a great shame, you know, that that uh, that, that people, in a way, you know, are, are kind of forced to to, you know, do things that, that, that maybe deep down they didn't really want to. But I think that this whole swing and and um, the goddess becoming very much more um, uh, visible was wonderful. But I always say to people, don't forget the craft is male female. We work together. We have priests and priestesses, and uh, which is to me are not just women. Um, I, and today, I think uh, I would actually fight more for you know where are the men, <laughs> where have they got to? And but it's, it's our fault actually. I think we as women should also take um, that on board as well. We've done a lot to frighten the men away. We've made them feel emasculated. We've made them feel. Uh, that their role within the craft is is not particularly important and reduce them to, uh, in fact, what Isaac Bonovitz said, just choir boys. And I take that really seriously because I think we have, as women, um, also quite a, a lot to, to, to answer for. Uh, on the one hand, I can say, yes, it's very nice that we're all uh, running around being priestesses, but we, you know, we also have to take on board the fact that we, um, you know, have gone a bit overboard with the goddess side and um so just for the record um i am not a feminist <laughs> never have been um i, I think i, I don't know you're, you're you're talking about you're talking about this this whole thing about the the gods um and and you're you're talking about the the priests um it's not my experience you know you know i'm an alexandrian so i'm i you know we're we're, we're in the same kind of you know um Mm -hmm. umbrella if mm -hmm. you want to call it I don't feel that you know in the Alexandrian tradition we do emphasize too much the goddess at all or that the role of the priests are you know um, a little bit you know set aside or kind of you know you know and for how it's the high priestess high priest um, it's it's actually Alex did that very make that very clear he, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, as him being, you know, the 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 
on top of things and and sometimes people criticized him because of that because he was mm-hmm. the one in charge instead of which is a shocker because you know you yeah, could yeah, think yeah. about oh it's the it's the high well, priestess it's, it's, what are you, you doing know, I, you know <laughs> the craft has evolved wicca has Absolutely, evolved uh, yeah, and that's why yeah. i'm coming back to the eclectic yeah. part gerald yeah. garner was very eclectic and yeah. to you, you, you know, um, in America, we talk about BTW, British Traditional Wicca, which in in, in, <laughs> in in the UK we, we think it's 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 quite funny, really. Yes, because... I know, I know. <laughs> I know. There is this whole argument about British Traditional Witchcraft, and people sometimes really do, they're very annoyed by it. Why are you calling British Traditional Witchcraft? Well, because yeah, 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 it is yeah. British because it comes from Britain. Yes, and yes. It's, I... You know, it's traditional because it's. Traditional Wicca, and it's yeah. you know that's what it is, and <laughs> it's, it's. I think for the, for the Americans, it's also important that that that, um, uh, that they yeah, also that, understand you know. as well. In Europe, we 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 are trying to evolve, and to, again, I come back to Wicca for me is very very organic. If we if we get stuck in dogma and all the arguments about books of shadows, you know, I know all of them, and I said, you know, guys, move on. Just let's <laughs> move on. And there are more important things in life than, than figuring out whether this red candle should be there. I know it's it's lovely to do that in circle, and it's great to say, you know, how did we do this? And that's fantastic. But the, the at the end of the day, what really counts is how are we actually working the craft today? And how are we dealing with climate change? How are we dealing with relationships? How are we dealing with the workplace? And in that sense, to me, we also have to take on board the very, very diverse um, uh, array of coming back to the gender question. Yes. You know, as, as I said, we're not, I'm not a 100% woman, and neither are you 100% man. We're all a complete, you know, w- that's what nature is. We're completely a, a wonderful array of all sorts of things and let's you know talk about how we can use that uh, background very creatively uh, for me it's uh, again coming back to how it's not just working with men and women of course the law of polarity has the male and female energies but ultimately ultimately we are working as uh, you know as, as, as human beings and yes, uh, yeah. to look at our own potential we also start having to look at what how can we express our spirituality i very early on i said wicca is the religion of self-expression that self-expression is also how do people express themselves in a masculine way how do they experience themselves in a female way and everything in between and it it, it is a hard one you know because i i've had all the um i've had gay people in my coven i've really really enjoyed the um the way for example uh people uh, uh for example gay people when we come to the beltane invocations that they've uh, written some beautiful poetry is absolutely amazing you know and i said i at that point i said you know i would love to integrate that into our rituals and we do we have integrated many of the rituals when i when i got the book of shadows we had very very few texts we only had six uh, uh, seasonal festivals um, there were very very my, my book of shadows I keep telling people my book of shadows is about 12 pages long 12 pages you know 12 <laughs> and the rest of it was um, go and figure it out and that's exactly what we did those first five years that Merlin and I we were looking at the concepts and saying does this make sense what we're actually doing does it make sense and a lot of things i found out very early on didn't make sense so we started holding things up to daylight and saying what how how would people have, have dealt with this and we came to some fascinating discoveries as you would as a farmer would discover things about the land so again coming back to this this sense of eclecticism um of course i've got the core material but I, I, I hope that all the people that I've initiated and, and uh, had in, in, in my coven also have the, the, the courage to change things, to, to look at things and see how things have evolved. So again, it's, it's looking at how men and women can work together, but also every different form of sexuality, how that figures in, how do we 
uh, celebrate festivals um what is the you know i, I say to people that there are um as far as I can see, sometimes the goddess can be more prominent, the god can be more prominent, but how do we deal with that within actually our rituals? <coughs> For example, if we say Samhain is a more, is a festival where we, we look at our ancestors and has a, a, a strong god element, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, a spring festival or Immort can have a more goddess element, but those are only little guidelines. Those are only little um, sort of signals. Uh, for me, it's I, I had this amazing feeling. For example, when when I was looking at Lamas very early on, I suddenly said, "You know, that's to me that's one of the most goddess-oriented festivals I can think of." <laughs> and then I, I discovered that this whole Lunas of story, the story of Luke in Celtic mythology had been actually Christianized and the emphasis on Lou was actually misplaced. He was actually uh, honoring the, um, the the death of his um, mother-in-law yes. uh, when she was giving childbirth. But the myth had actually been Christianized into this kind of soul invictus, the sacrifice of the son. I'm thinking, hello, this is, this is not really, uh, from a pagan perspective, this is very much been change into a Christian perspective. So I think we have to be very, very open to um, what what nature itself is telling us, what the gods are telling us as well. But who are the gods? Again, coming back to who, who are your gods? And for somebody who's a transgender or gay or whatever, to me, that is absolutely not important. I really hope when people come to me and say, you know, I'm interested in the craft, who are you, that they give me their name. I don't like it when people say, I'm gay, and I'd like to find out more about the craft. Well, <laughs> you obviously need to go and talk to people who are gay, not talk to me, <laughs> because I'm not there to be to to talk about gayness. Yeah. And uh, I have a lot of gay yeah. friends, and we, 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 we have a lot of, we crack out laughing, you know, and I say, you know, as a heterosexual at interfaith um, conferences, you know, I can really talk about the gay situation which I did in Barcelona I was in, in the seminars with all the gay people and I said because I, I can probably not be too emotional um, so I could be a very very good spokesperson for the gay community you know and it's but this is how we can help each other whereas mm -hmm. gay people may get very emotional about oh you know I just say no I can look at it from a very you know neutral point of view and we then find out, hey, we can actually help each other because we don't get emotionally involved. We can actually start seeing things in a much more, in a way, a more objective manner. And that has always been for me an absolutely uh, wonderful way of working with gay people. How do you see the goddess? You know, how do you, and we, we have wonderful discussions and then they'll come up with the most incredible invocations um, but they'll, they'll turn around to me and, and, and uh, I may see something that they haven't seen. So we learn from each other and I think we inspire each other and I think that is the important thing. And if people really take that on board, then to me the heart of the craft is something which is very creative and is um, also even from an ethical point of view, is questioning who we are, you know, and above all be honest with yourself don't don't think the gods can really you know if you if you honest with yourself then you can really um do so much more but don't you know don't get upset if you make a mistake and don't lie about things i think that's to me also a very important part of the whole experience is to really start saying i made a mistake or you know, I was pretty homophobic or I was this or I was that, but take it on board that you're willing actually to change. And mm -hmm. let's face it, nobody can change you except yourself. yourself. I can't yeah, change you. Yeah. You can only change yourself. So yeah. a lot of the craft philosophy has also been, you know, man know thyself as a bobby blow, all the occult uh, 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 laws. Uh, yeah. laws that yeah. really need to be taken on board. And I think for a lot of people that is frightening because suddenly you have to start really, really being honest and take a deep breath and say oh, oh, it's scary of course it's yeah. scary but if we have that faith that, that, that and I, I do talk about faith in the sense of having the knowledge that the gods will 
help us and that we will actually stand by us. Uh, the gods will not ever let us really go. They let us go deep. But as I, I, I try to help people, I'm, uh, you know, as I say, guiding, I say, look, I will let you fall until it really hurts because you won't, you can't experience things unless you really, really, really feel it. You know, a butterfly, if you try to help a butterfly out of a cocoon because you think you're helping it, you actually are, are stealing their chance of actually learning to fly. So I say, you know, do not feel that you know you're helping somebody by taking away their mystery which is perhaps what the you know the priests have done for us in in, in christianity they've taken away that magical side that mystery so i i think it's wonderful when people uh, come with so many different ideas and you know they they, they feel very comfortable um and and feel safe i think that's what we can do as elders we can help people to feel safe that they're not going to be ridiculed and not going to be uh seen as being freaks just because you know they, they've had various ideas or what have you that we do have a general acceptance of people as they are mm -hmm. so for me somebody to come and say you know i'm gay well fine great what else? What else is going on in your life? Yeah. Other have, than you, have, you bought, have you bought an apple tart? <laughs> you yes. know, I, I like cakes. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, I had, I had, um, I have, uh, um, you know, I, I just wanted to say, ladies and gentlemen, this is Morgana. Um, beyond the broomstick thoughts of um, of the on, on on the philosophy of Wicca, uh, a fantastic book in which talk it looks like a ghost book but it's actually not um it's it's a very <laughs> solid book i assure you um and um with very uh essential concepts on the philosophy of wicca that mm -hmm. um are very clear and you know so um the other thing that i think that it's very interesting and and you talked about that quite a lot um over your your conversation with me is is that sense of of practicality of doing mm -hmm. it um and living it as you yes. breathe uh which is very important for you because you said you know it's not about only about the you know the, the circle it's all it's all it's all also about outside and what you do with your life and how you do it and how you apply um you know wicca outside of it um mm -hmm. because you said yourself that this is a way of life um, yes, yeah, that yeah. you you know that very much you know um, you carried out. I'm I'm very much um, interested in in talk about that uh, in the few m minutes that actually <laughs> you know we have of the mm -hmm. show um, about about that carry on from you know the, what we always know as the, you know the sacred circle outside to to life and to be mm -hmm. you know to be with you know and and to use that magic outside how do mm -hmm. you do that how 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 can, how is that possible um to me it's not imp it's not absolutely essential that everybody's initiated that's one, one thing i would really really like to emphasize to actually um revere the gods to revere uh, nature it is actually not necessary to be initiated which is probably for a lot of people not nice to hear, but it's true. <laughs> That's my <laughs> truth, by the way. Yeah. Now, seriously, yeah. if people feel that um, there is a calling, you can start immediately. I would say to people, keep a magical diary. Just see what's happening when the, when the moon is full. How do you feel? What happens when it's new moon? Follow the moon cycles, mm -hmm. but also follow... Um, the seasonal cycles, how do you feel in the summer, how do you feel in the winter just take note and if you feel a calling to go even on your balcony, if you live in the city, even just to go and sing and dance or just look at the moon and just see what the moon do it, you don't need anybody to tell you how to actually commune with nature and there may be a lot of people who laugh at people hugging trees and all the rest of it but it's actually something I say, go and do it. You know, if you feel that a tree can help you, who cares, you know, who cares if you're <clears throat> sitting there uh, hugging a tree and people are laughing at you? Don't, you know, don't worry. People do some strange things. But it, for me, it's practice is you can start right now. 
you know, it, it's it's night time. Go and look at what, what what's happening with the moon. We've just had a new moon yesterday. It's the beginning of a new uh, uh, new lunar cycle. Go and figure out what what you want. What what do you really want? And for a lot of people, that's a very difficult question. They will say, "I want my children to be happy. I want my boss to be pleased with my work." No, ask the question again. What do I want? And a lot of people find that really, really hard because people don't actually even think that they're allowed to better themselves or there's some sort of Christian ideal that you, you know, you're there to, you know, the sins of the mind and all the rest of it. No, you can also take uh, on board your own spirituality and how you do it is entirely up to you. If you feel that you want more help and you feel that the, the initiatory way is also for you, then go and look for people that can tell you or, or help you. There's nothing wrong with that either. But don't think, oh, I can't find a teacher. I can't do anything. Actually, that, that's crazy. You can start right now. So when when I'm traveling, even like now, if there's just one person there say, my God, she's, she's right. I can start right now. Go and do it. And don't, don't really take too much notice of what people say or that you're crazy and all the rest of it you're not crazy what you're actually doing is answering the call and for uh, i think today the the call is look at what's happening around you 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 can do a lot you don't have to uh bow down to to politicians and take on board being a witch you're going to ask some really horrible questions you're going to be subversive you may ask questions and you may or people may ask questions of you which may f make them feel uncomfortable let them feel uncomfortable there's too much political correctness there's too much sanitization going on when we That's actually true, say yeah. look at what is happening around you and have the courage to actually start you know using that as your guide and you'll find actually once you start uh, really calling then you will actually get the people coming to you and the people who will support you so uh, it's not just, just the gods who'll support you, but if you're serious about it, and I do actually mean that very seriously, and not think it's going to happen instantly, no, it's a lot of hard work because you really have to be consistent. There's a lot of self-discipline that's necessary. Uh, and there are moments when you're going to say, what, what am I doing this for? It's just, you know, so there are going to be moments when you really, really feel down, but know that you're not alone. And I think that's the message for, for a lot of people. You're not alone, um, but you don't have to be initiated. You can start right now and just start from where you are and uh, yeah. just have the courage to take the next step. You know, reading books is one thing, but actually doing things is the thing that will really bring you the, the most joy. Yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, Morgana with uh, the author of the book Beyond the Broomstick. And Which is also in Spanish. <laughs> yes, it way. is. And yes. and yes. Uh, is it is it um wh what is it the other language? Is it Swedish Swedish? No. What is no, it? No, no, um, no. Um, it's in English, Dutch, Hungarian. Dutch, Dutch, Dutch. That's what I'm. Dutch, uh, yeah, yes. of course it's in yeah, Dutch. Yeah, 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 yeah. yes. Um, um, Hungarian, um, Spanish, and the Polish version is just about to be launched. All right. Now, this is the obvious question. Why not Portuguese? Uh, <laughs> well, you do have a lot. You know that you have a lot of people in Brazil and yes. Portugal. I'm not even talking oh, about well, Portugal, which is this tiny little country um, right beside Spain, for those who don't know. Um, but mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you have Brazil, which is huge. I mean, it's a huge market. Yes, yes. <clears throat> well, yes. It, it takes time. It takes time. I really need to... I mean, first of all, I need somebody to offer to say, hey, I'd like to do hey, the Portuguese I would like version. So, hey, I yes. <laughs> And we'll see yes. what we can do. Yeah. Yes, As I say, we were concentrating on the Spanish version because uh, I was in Panama and um, uh, Latin America. Uh, there are lots and lots of nice things going on with PFI in, in uh, Southern and Central America, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm very grateful to Lazel for PFI Panama, but also uh, Nero for PFI uh, South America, Brazil, but also yeah. Mexico. So the uh, Spanish and Portuguese uh, uh, speaking parts of the world are also becoming much more important. Spanish, I say, is the second language of PFI now. So um, the Spanish version was very, very important, but 
yeah, hey, if there's someone out there who wants to do the and Portuguese version, you know, get in touch with me. You know. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> now, we, we do have to talk a little bit about who made the Spanish version, the Spanish translation. Yes, uh, yes. I'll yes, have, he's... Uh, <laughs> and Dan, can you tell us a little bit about yeah, yeah, he's he's been he's he's an absolute star. He's he's um, done ever such a lot, also for interface. Um, he's the one to watch for. <laughs> yes, yes. He's 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 very young, but very talented is our Daniel. So hey, Daniel, yeah. hi. Hi, hi, Daniel. <laughs> he probably <put> completely red. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know and I think, are, are we talking about Madrid, right? We're talking about Madrid, Spain, uh, no, Madrid. No, no, no. Uh, no? Uh, well, no, Daniel, Daniel's in, in the northern part of uh, Spain from oh, the Basque yes, Country. yes, yes, Basque yes. Country. Why would I have thought that he was Madrid? Ooh, that's not Ooh. something to think. Ooh, well, because, you know, uh, no, right. no we we were in Madrid. We were in Madrid in December, and there's lots going on in Madrid at the moment. So oh, um, that's why. That's why I thought that he was. No, no, no. He's in the Basque Country. Ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. All right. So that's <laughs> complete different part of Spain. Um, yes. So yes. So it's it's very very wonderful to um, you know to know that you have the, all of these translations. You know, the more the merrier. And if there's anybody mm -hmm. willing to do this in Portuguese, that would be wonderful. <laughs> and you know, Whoa. who knows? I mean, you know, other languages you know um that would be wonderful too so it's it's a wonderful book it was in it, w w when was this uh, first published i mean this was you know i think that the first published series um of these articles was 1980 and then yes, you know yes, yes. yes and, and and then you have this this uh 2010 um edition of it which is absolutely amazing well the and, the and, uh, um the Dutch version was actually um, printed as a, a booklet in 1982. Mm. Um, so, uh, of course, we were working in Holland. So, the 1982 version of Twee uh, de Bezem was, was, we used it for many, many years. Mm. And then in 2008, <clears throat> the English version was um, uh, published. And then shortly after, we decided to do the uh, the Dutch version again, give it a new new cover. The cover, by the way, is also from a very good friend of mine who also does the uh, did the covers for Wiccan Raid, and she's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. She has a beautiful absolutely feel. Absolutely amazing. I, w yes, I wanted yes, to tell. Absolutely. I wanted to. I always go for this on on when we have books on Witch Talk because I think it's necessary. Everyone just forgets about you know they focus on the author, they forget about the artists and the cover artists and everything. So this was made by Alexandra. Uh, help me on this last name because I'm not, I don't know how uh, to. Yeah, I, it. I know it's Amanda Gora. Um, is it Chicheki? Chicheki, oh, I think. Uh, yes. Yeah, well, that, that would be it. I didn't know how to pronounce it. Chicheki. Okay. Alexander mm -hmm. Chicheki is the artist that actually put together this fantastic um, cover of the Yeah, of the and book. more I'm of her to... work is actually uh, on silvercircle.org. Yes. Uh, yes. If you look at the old um, editions of Wick and Raid, the magazine which is now online, but we yes. did have a paper version until 90, uh, till 2000. 10 yeah i think 2010 mm -hmm. we only recently went online it just became too expensive unfortunately um but she designed all the covers for about the last 10 years and brilliant covers and, and uh, go and have a look at her work on uh silvercircle.org if people are interested in in alexandra's uh work uh for yeah, wick and raid yeah. as well yeah, absolutely, absolutely yeah. amazing 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 mm -hmm. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Morgana, the author of uh, Beyond the Broomstick, Thoughts on the Philosophy of Wicca. Thank you so much for being on Witch Talk, Morgana, and to... Um, it's fun, yeah. <laughs> Thanks it, very much, Paragon. And uh, as I um, if people want to get in touch, then uh, um, org is the place to go and have a look at for contact addresses. That's, That's all you need great. to know. That's yeah. all you need to know. That's the magic address uh, for you. Yes. Um, so don't go anywhere, Morgana. I'm going to talk to you afterwards a little bit. I'm just going to finish the show. All right. Okay. And, thanks uh, very, very much. It was wonderful thank being you. on the show. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. So, uh, um, Bye, 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 Morgana. Bye, bye. thank you. Bye. bye, bye, bye. So, thank you so much, everyone, um, for being here on Witch Talk. Uh, we're just finishing it. Thank you so much for everyone uh, in Spain, Portugal, and everywhere else. Uh, Master Nestor, thank you. And we'll be here next week with another show. Until then, have a wonderful week. Bye, bye. <laughs>